the recording. Can I make an announcement? A little bit. Yeah, and I, I just want to let everyone know that I'm going to be managing the chat window, so feel free to um, put any notes or questions in the chat. What we're going to do is have four different presenters. Blair is actually five, because Blair is going to kick us off and tell us about the project. And then each of the groups is going to present, and they're going to take questions during their 10 minutes. So feel free to, as they're talking, to send questions into the chat window. Okay. okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah? OK, yeah. great. Um, well, I want to start by just thanking uh, Becca and Mike um, and all of you for welcoming the Asset Innovation Incubator to Deber today. And I'm going to um, you know, chat a little more um, quickly through this than I had planned, so we are sure to let our presenters um, share what they have planned for today. But, one of the things that I have uh, made the mistake of doing when introducing the Innovation Incubator is assuming that everyone in the room knows what an incubator is. So I'm going to just quickly define what an incubator is, at least to us. And to us, that's a safe resource space in which to grow new innovative ideas. So that's, that's how we define an incubator over here at Asset. And to give you a little bit of a background, um, ASSET, which stands for Arts and Sciences Support of Education through a Technology, decided about a year and a half ago that we wanted to elbow our way into this already robust innovation ecosystem on campus and um, you know, create a space for the College of Arts and Sciences in innovation, which you can see from this um, new map, we're there. <laughs> we made our way in. So, in October of 2018, we released a call for proposals um, asking for faculty from across the College of Arts and Sciences to submit their innovative teaching and learning ideas to us. We had about over 40 submissions, which we ultimately, many of them we sorted into affinity groups that we saw cropping up in the submissions that are now the four working teams that are participating in the incubator today. Largely what we were asking the faculty, faculty to respond to and that they're now um, working through is exploring this, the driving question behind the incubator, which is how do we get students out of their seats and into active learning? And of course, um, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we do need to expand that question and think about it more broadly across uh, diverse teaching and learning environments, which includes in-person, hybrid, and remote learning as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge the wonderful people who are behind the incubator, my asset colleagues, which include Joy Adams, Amanda McAndrew, JC Moriyama, and Shane Schweikert. In, addi in addition to the many projects that they're juggling on behalf of the asset department to bring excellence to teaching and learning with technology with the College of Arts and Sciences, each of them is also leading one of the four teams that are participating in the incubator. Um, we also, even further behind the scenes, but no less important, we also have Mark Werner, Dean David Brown, and the asset faculty advisor, Beth Osnes from the um, Department of Theater and Dance, who are supporting the incubator. Um, this, these are the faces of many of the wonderful faculty who are participating in the incubator. They're not all represented here. Uh, we have 26 faculty, as I mentioned, participating across four teams, and you'll get to meet representatives, representatives from each of those project teams in just a few moments. Um, the teams themselves are focused on inclusive data science, uh, student success, CAMP, which is the collective to advance multimodal participatory publishing, and metacognition and well-being. And over the last past academic year, as I said, they have been exploring our driving question and um, working hard to release and test pilots and create prototypes within their focus areas. And you'll get to learn uh, more about those in just a few minutes. I want to close, I'd open by describing an incubator as a safe resource space. And I want to cl close by saying over the past couple of weeks, my confidence in, in this group has just been fortified by the way that they have forged ahead with their projects. And I, I know that with uncertain times ahead and not really know, knowing what's coming, um, that they're gonna be able to respond to pivots and course changes that might be you know, forced upon them with the changes 
that may come. Um, and some of the safety that allows for this kind of um, this capacity to be nimble during uncertain times, it comes from working collaboratively um, and, you know, really working together to create a teaching and learning environment at the university to meet the vision that um, we both hold at the incubator and that we hold at the university level for inclusivity, accessibility, and excellence. And now, with no further ado, I'd like to pass the things along to our first presenter, Ruth Heisler. And just a reminder that um, any comments or questions you can throw in the chat window um, while Ruth is talking and we'll help her manage that. Because I think, Ruth, you're gonna share your screen, yeah? I am, I am working on it right now. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, for some reason my share screen doesn't wanna come up. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Let's see if I can get it into PowerPoint mode here. Here we go. Okay. So, um, first of all, I want to recognize the, um, the rest of my cohort. So, we are incubator or innovation incubator team student success. And we have um, Mikkel Carter from Psychology and Neuroscience, Michelle Ferguson from Political Science, um, myself from Integrated Physiology, Catherine Kuntz from the Program for Writing and Rhetoric, and then David Parody from History. So we have a very diverse representation of departments, which is great. And then we've been very fortunate to have both JC and, and Blair as our co-facilitators, and they've done a great job of harnessing our energy and trying to come up with, help us come up with this unifying goal. And so really what our unifying goal is, we're trying to um, come up with ways to use technology to generate meaningful opportunities for students, both inside and outside of the classroom. And I think one of the bigger challenges here is that we really have to keep in mind that there's no one perfect fit model. And so what we're really doing is brainstorming ideas that will work differently in different majors and in different classrooms. So to that, we've, we've kind of ended up in three subgroups. And so I'm going to um, just talk a little bit about what each of these subgroups is doing. The first group made up of Michelle, Catherine, and David. And if any of you happen to be online, I didn't check to see, please feel free to, to jump in at any point if you wanna add anything. Um, so this particular group is, has come up with a goal of, of finding ways to train and encourage more faculty to explore how role-playing games might be effectively used in an educational setting here on campus. And um, last fall, they put out a call for people who might be interested in a book review club of Minds on Fire, which was written by Mark Carnes, a historian at Barnard College. They capped this book review club at 14 faculty, staff, and graduate students. And um, it's based around reacting to the past pedagogy. So how to use or involve role-playing games in various historical scenarios. I know that both Michelle and Catherine have gone to conferences to learn how to effectively do this and incorporate it into classrooms as well. Um, for assessment, they are planning on surveying the members of the club, collect some qualitative and quantitative data around um, how effective it might have been. Now, an interesting offshoot of the um, book club is that it sparked interest in trying to do something similarly for undergraduates. And so Sam Kindick, who is the manager of the Assets Student Technology Consultants, he put together a book club um, for undergrads and the book club was uh, or has been reading Designing Your Life. And unfortunately, they were only able to meet once in person before they had to go to remote teaching, which I understand um, dramatically impacted their participation. They had several students drop off. Um, they did collect some pre-participant data and then they hope to assess, send out a post um, comparative assessment for those students who are still involved. So that is what the first subgroup is up to. 
if anybody has any questions on them, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, I will move into subgroup two. And this is um, something that JC and I have been working on. And so the goal of this particular um, subgroup is to look at specifically the freshman group and the freshman cohort. So the idea here is to try and set students up from the get-go with skills and a mindset that will help them persist not just to their sophomore year, but through their undergraduate career and then hopefully beyond. And this is something that I've been working on for quite a while in integrated physiology. Our students don't actually typically take an initial IFI course until their sophomore year. And it's very hard to connect with them in that freshman space. And I see that as a major lost opportunity. And so I had been working on developing a course already, just a one credit seminar for our freshmen. And I mentioned it to Nicole Barger in eBio and Nancy Guild in MCDB, and they both got excited about it as well. And so we are collaborating, each offering our own sections of this course for our specific majors. And being able to pull in different communities from around campus to connect them with our students. Um, biology advisors are really excited about this. Uh, I've been talking with the academic coaching team, bringing in peer forums, um, pre-health advising, so all types of different resources on a week-by-week -week basis that we would introduce to our students. Now, one thing that came out of it that that JC um, really pushed me towards, and I'm pretty excited about, is using this as a jumping off point for a special interest group in the fall. And so we'll be putting out a call to other arts and sciences faculty who might want to get together and have discussions around creating something like this for other academic units who might be interested. One of the problems we've landed on um, that we're working on solutions for is in integrated physiology, for instance, we have 2,000 majors, so we might be looking at a group of 300 or 400 students, which is not very conducive to creating a nice, cozy little freshman group to try and connect with. So um, we're looking at trying to implement a peer mentoring program, um, hiring some former, we call them undergraduate teaching assistants in our department. We're not part of the, the LA program. Uh, but but taking some experienced undergrad TAs and using them to help train and oversee a group of peer mentors that might be involved with this course. And then um, as far as assessment for, for this particular uh, program, we'd be again relying on surveys and using Qualtrics to evaluate and administer to students of the class, as well as an evaluation of the lead undergrad TA that we would be using for our peer mentors. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to academic coaching and Audrey Blankenheim in particular, and they bring in interns every fall and she would love to pair interns with groups of students in our class. So that's something new that I've been working on that I'm also really excited about. Okay, and then the final subgroup, Mikkel Carter have, and JC have been working on a collaboration with the Learning Assistant Program, which I know many of you are already familiar with. And he is very interested in trying to incorporate more peer-to-peer -peer instruction in classrooms across campus. And so he would really like to leverage the training that's already occurring of various LAs. And many of those trained LAs, I understand, become LA mentors, and he would like to take it a step further and have a senior LA position that works directly with faculty uh, to, to provide a student perspective. And um, these, these senior LAs may or may not be present in the classrooms. And one thing that was mentioned is that potentially they could take on a, a one-on-one one -on -one flipped tutoring sessions where the students actually try to teach to that the senior LA uh, as part of that session. Initial plans are to work with six to eight pairs of faculty and senior LAs in this program. Okay, and again, um, the survey will be used as an assessment to 
um, that will go out to students who are enrolled in these courses to gain their perspective. So that really is all I have about what's happening in our student success group, and I'm open to any questions you might have. All right, awesome. I think the next presenter is, thanks Ruth. Sure. Um, Nicole, are you ready to share your screen? So uh, Sarah has a question. I think this is for Blair. What resources are available to the incubators and persistence? Do you want to address that, Blair? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you read the question again? I missed the sort of the back. What, res what, what resources we have to do these projects and what resources might be available to participants in the project? Okay. And sorry, and who was the question from? Sarah White. Okay, thanks, Sarah, for your question. So what resources are available to uh, the faculty participating in the incubator? So we have funding. Um, and we have funding that's allocated to the larger team project, as well as um, for individual faculty professional development um, awards, as well as um, starting in years two and three, we have funding that will um, enable us to bring students into the project. So we're looking for a high level of participation in the incubator from undergraduate students. So that's so great they'll be able to play a part in shaping their own experience, learning experience. Um, we also provide um, op, you know, coaching opportunities through the uh, asset faculty who are acting as team leads as well as the role that I play in the incubator and um, uh, various resources and opportunities to bring their ideas to a larger audience. Um, we've, we held an, uh, an event earlier in the semester where faculty were able to essentially practice their pitch and get uh, feedback from um, a really diverse group of uh, attendees at that, that event. Um, and of course, also working to communicate about the projects and create interest and excitement across the campus and across the greater Boulder community and even beyond about these projects to uh, potentially connect our participants to future funding as well as working to identify sustainable homes for um, proven and successful projects down the line. So we wanna, um, for projects that really take off, we, we are working um, on behalf of the faculty to identify sustainable homes for them on campus. Awesome, thanks. Nicole, you wanna go ahead and get started? Sure, um, so much like uh, Ruth's group, we're, we're kind of eclectic. <laughs> I am part of the um, camp uh, group, which is basically the Collective to Advance Multimodal Participatory Publishing, and that's a mouthful. Um, but basically, every single group in this, or every single uh, person in this group, has some sort of aspect of using technology, um, connecting students with the idea that they can be co-creators of knowledge or creators of knowledge and find ways to publish and share that knowledge. Um, so our mission statement is that CAMP promotes faculty and student curation, cultivation, co-creation, and publication of knowledge. Um, it just so happens that most of us are humanists, and so we don't have um, a strong science or STEM connection at the moment. Um, although I know that most of the types of projects that we're doing, we sort of certainly could see applications to this to expand um, across uh, arts and sciences, not just the humanities. Um, so. Let's see, I've got to get out of my own way. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, this is basically our team. Um, we obviously have our wonderful folks from Asset, Amanda, Sarah, and Blair helping us out. And then we have um, Rachel Degman from English, Kristen Drybread from Anthropology and PWR, Jay Ellis from PWR, myself from um, Sewell Rap and also the History Department, Suzanne Magnanini from French and Italian, um, Beth from Theater and Drama, and um, Caroline from the library, Caroline Sinkinson from the library. And so I'm gonna just take you through a couple of the projects. I don't actually have one for every single person I think in our group. Um, I, I solicited uh, 
feedback to put into the slides and got most of the folks participating, but not necessarily all participating. Um, so Rachel is uh, working and has been working on the Shakespeare CoLab for a while. Um, by working with uh, the incubator group, she is taking this to a new level. And if you take a look at these two images on this slide, you can kind of see what this is all about. Um, they're putting together an, an electronic edition of Shakespeare, which then students can contribute to by annotating. So students are learning skills about um, how to do the HTML and the coding that it takes to put together an electronic edition like this but also learning about the research skills to um, come up with the types of annotations that a, that a critical edition would have normally. Um, so if you think about a critical edition when it's done in a published book format versus an online format, you can see where um, the online format has the opportunity to open it out to multiple students to take part and take little small pieces um, of the research on and help contribute to the whole. Um, so this is, this is Rachel's project. Um, and she basically sent me this blurb, and I, I, I haven't done this for every single person, but I thought it, it uh, was pretty clear, um, particularly that this, uh, she's working to in integrate this into a larger class, a digital editions class, in which students will learn to create their own digital editions of texts using H, uh, sorry, HTML, XML, and CSS. Um, so one of the things that you'll notice across this is that we all, many of these projects have already students and classes in mind, but we also are hoping in the long run to have some student participants um, to help us in the collective um, create some of the platforms that we're using or make those platforms better. Um, we are not quite there yet, but right at the moment we're working on um, what we could do to potentially hire some students to help uh, flesh out all of these projects and so what would be the kinds of things they could add to what we're doing maybe some design skills maybe some coding skills um, maybe film editing you know we've got all these different possibilities for the kinds of publications we want to see happen and so whenever you hear each one of these projects there's a potential also that we might be then connecting with a student to get them some some opportunity to learn some of these skills but also share their skills and potentially create something of their own with the collective um, so this was submitted by um, Beth about in, from Inside the Greenhouse. Um, she has, a, I have a link here if you, anybody wants to go back and see it later. This is a letter um, from the Arts and Sciences Support of Education Through Technology where she highlighted one of the students that joined them. Um, this is a student spotlight. And we have um, Emmett Norris who basically came as an exchange um, uh, visiting student and and took part in uh, a bunch of different things. One of the main pieces of this is um, putting together materials for a conference that they went to and then also um, open educational resources. Um, so he was helping in the co-creation of these um, called Drawdown Act Up for creatively engaging students and communicating drawdown solutions. Um, it's it's a really cool project if you read about it i'm going to stumble all over myself if i try to explain it so if beth's on and wants to jump in she certainly can <laughs> but um this is this is really a neat um in, instance one instance of a student participating in something that then gets published and, and potentially used by other faculty and students um that's also got a, a multiple projects going so this is certainly not the only one but it's, it's the one that she sent me slides for. Um, the next one is Journal 2020, um, which has Jay Ellis and um, as kind of the faculty mentor to a student publication um, that is already underway and um, looking to leverage what we can do with CAMP to help expand the capabilities, um, enhance the capabilities of the, the student staff working for Journal 2020. Um, this is basically a, a yearly edition of creative nonfiction. Um, and Jay's got a great staff of students who are already working with him. Um, they do a print issue and an online issue and a digital issue, online digital issue. Um, and this just kind of shows you a little tiny bit about what that is about. Um, so again, students already involved in a project, potentially looking at ways to expand that involvement or enhance that involvement. 
Um, Caroline is working for, from the libraries and she's very interested in cultivating information literacies and digital environmentalism among learners. And so she's looking to work with students um, to create a set of open educational resources around these topics. Um, again, like most of us, we're in different, different spaces on this. And I know um, Caroline is uh, in the process of uh, look, working out what types of um, open educational resources to, to create and to get student feedback on those resources. Um, she said basically in the first phase, the one that she's in right now is to create and develop learning plans, content and modules that invite learners critical exploration, um, that invite learners critical exploration of information literacies and digital environmentalism, um, supports experiential digital teaching and learning, such as Buffs Create and other camp projects. Um, if you have not yet had a chance to, to hear something, whoops, hear something about Buffs Create, um, Buffs Create is, amazing. I've been screaming it from the rooftops to all my colleagues. The idea that students can have the opportunity to create their own domain and figure out what that should look like and, and how to be a good steward of the information that they want to share with the internet. Um, whether that's personal information or a portfolio or a blog, um, this platform allows students to do lots of different things. Um, and several of us on camp are using this platform in different ways with our students and also rolling it into various projects that we're working on with camp at the moment. Um, Suzanne Magnanini is working on the Fairy Tales repository. Um, Special Collections and Archives has an amazing collection of fairy tales um, illustrated and um, they're, just, they're amazing, they're beautiful. If you ever get a chance to go to Special Collections and, and see some of these in person, it's fantastic. Um, but this is a collaborative project between Suzanne and, and Special Collections and students who are helping to classify and describe um, these historical fairy tales. And so she's given me a couple uh, slides here to sort of, or images here to share a little bit about what this looks like. Um, this will eventually be a searchable database, um, but students are actually are taking part in the act of creating the database and, and adding information, learning what kinds of information needs to be uh, collected and, and added together for this type of presentation. Um, so that's a, a, an amazing resource that's also already underway, um, but will be developed further with CAMP uh, through, through the collective. And finally, I've got, my project is still sort of in that nebulous phase where I've got lots of things, throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Um, this is Pursuing the Past is the umbrella title I'm giving this. You can see two aspects of this. Um, this last semester, I had students working on an exhibit called 20th Century World at War, also using items from special collections and archives. Um, they had to catalog the items, not that they aren't already cataloged, but to do it in such a way using Dublin Core data that um, is searchable and, and um, accessible in a different way through the Omeka database, and then use the items that they've cataloged to create an exhibit space um, and that space could be a single page, it could be multiple pages. Most of my students did a single page item, but then together they added up to the whole. Um, each, each page had an aspect of 20th century world at war to, to explore with the items that they chose to highlight. So this is just an example of um, a stu the student's piece on women uh, being used to recruit men in posters, recruitment posters. Um, so this is this really interesting aspect of, of um, sort of the student designing what they want to talk about, how they want to talk about it, how they want to present the information. And going forward, I'd like to develop more creative um, license to how these actual pages look. I mean, right now they have the choices of what to choose in terms of images, but the my CSS skills are <laughs> iffy and the modules within Emeka are fairly set. And so um, potentially we're looking to get some student involvement in how to create uh, more appealing pages for these exhibits. Um, this one over here on the, the right is one from this semester. Students created a compendium, um, which is a little bit like uh, Rachel's project in that I asked them to pick an aspect of the First Crusade, which we were studying earlier in the semester, um, and to create an entry for that person, place, or thing related to the First Crusade um, to help people get a, a more insight, almost like a little in, encyclo mini encyclopedia of, of people, places, and events relating to the First Crusade. And so the students um, put together their entries, and this is that splash page for the compendium. 
Um, the, the goal hey, in Nikki, I think, I think, sorry, I think we need to move on. I'm yeah, sure no, so that's, that's questions. pretty much it. I was just going to okay. say the only thing I would add is if anybody is interested in this type of publishing, um, I think anybody in camp would be really willing to share the things we've learned so, so far and where we might potentially want to go next. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Nikki. Awesome. All right, June and Joy, I think are up next. Are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Um, Joy and I are going to be co-presenting this, so um, we'll be tag-teaming how we go about the slides. Joy will start and then I'll follow and then Joy will, will come back again. Sound good, Joy? Yes, and I just need uh, Nikki to stop the screen share so that I can share. Let's... Sorry, it's stuck on me. It's That's okay. Me. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Mike, you can probably, I don't know if you can do something. You know what? I'm just going to get out and come back into the meeting, and that way it'll okay. break. Up, oh, you're out. Oh, wait, there, That's good. there it is. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks. Thank you. All, All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I am just pulling up the screen share. I'll just take just a moment here. You should be seeing my slides here. Just a second. All right. Everybody seeing the title slide? Yes. All right. Great. So um, as June mentioned, um, I'm Joy Adams. I am the team lead from ASSET for the Metacognition and Wellbeing team. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project to help you get started. And then June's going to tell you a little bit about some of her research, because what we want to illustrate today is a little bit about how the research and practice um, interface with each other within our project. Um, so I'll start off by just giving you a little introduction to who we are. Um, this is our team. It includes myself from Asset, uh, Becca, our hostess for today's session from CTL, Beth Dusenberry from Classics, June Gruber from Psychology and Neuroscience, Young Min from the Program for Writing and Rhetoric, Shane Oshetsky from the Student Academic Success Center, Cheryl Pinzone from the Center for Teaching and Learning, and Galina Sergisic from the uh, GRAP, the Global uh, Residential Academic Program. We're really fortunate and then we have a really interesting cross-section of faculty in our group. Um, but what's really kind of cool about our group is about half of us are staff. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity to kind of think about how we're all working together in support of students and faculty and really building on some of the collective wisdom that we have in our respective offices. Um, share with you just a little bit about what we've got going on at a high level. Our big goal is really to integrate metacognition and emotional well-being uh, using technology to help support student learning at CU. Another piece of this is really thinking about how we can support faculty as well. Um, so part of our goal is providing resources that are really easy for faculty to use that are generally like plug and play kind of things. So that regardless of your discipline, regardless of the course you teach, if you find value in metacognition and in mindfulness for your students um, in terms of a way of supporting them either academically or personally, you can bring these things into your courses without having to be an expert on any of this or without even having to know how to do this in Canvas. We're going to do some of that for you and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Um, our vision is that we are helping to create a campus community that attends to the cognitive and emotional well-being of its members. June's going to talk a lot more about context here in just a moment, so I'll leave that with her. Um, my role today is to tell you a little bit about some of the outcomes we envision for the project. Um, one of these is a repository of learning objects in Canvas. I'm going to give you a very quick demo of our prototype site in just a moment. Um, essentially, this is a place where faculty can uh, share resources that they're using in their own courses related to metacognition, mindfulness, and well-being, um, or where they can come and they can borrow resources. Everything in here is available for people to pick and choose and use right within their own courses. And part of our goal is to utilize the technology that's provided to us on campus, which is Canvas, which everybody has access to, as a way of making that really smooth and easy for people. We don't want people to have to learn technology, to have to learn the pedagogy, in order to be able to do some of these things in their own courses and get started. Um, going along with that, of course, we'll need to train our faculty on how to utilize the resources that we're envisioning um, in later years of the project, having some faculty development opportunities for folks who want to learn how to do this in their own classes. Um, and a really interesting idea that's come up lately with some of the partners we've been talking with around campus is potentially even utilizing our learning objects repository to create a self-paced student uh, course or a site where students can come and get resources directly. So if they're in a course that isn't necessarily using the learning objects repository, yet students feel they might benefit from some of these activities, they could go and they could experiment with some of these on their own. 
Um, so we're thinking about maybe a couple of different faces for this information, one that's faculty facing where people can kind of come and take and borrow, and one that might be student facing for students whose um, faculty maybe aren't participating. So we can kind of broaden the impact of the project. Um, we do provide support for team members teaching and research. June's going to talk to you a little bit about some of her academic research, but another example, one of our team members, young men, is interested in developing a new course, uh, potentially around bringing mindfulness into the writing process. So we will help to support her with her course proposal. Um, and it's sort of that's some of the reciprocity that group members have uh, between us. Um, and then finally, our long-term vision is as our project progresses to hopefully have some collaborative research and publications to tell all y'all and the rest of the world about all the things that we've been doing and how successful they've been. So I am going to give you a really quick demo of the Learning Objects Repository. I do want to preface this by saying this is a prototype, so um, some of these are just placeholders. Uh, but I am going to show you a little bit about what this might look like just to whet your appetite, because at the end of our time, June and I are going to tell you a little bit about how you can get involved if this is something you're interested in. So as I mentioned, uh, the repository is going to be housed in Canvas. Um, one, of, one reason for that is it's something that we all have access to and most of us have at least some familiarity with using. But another is our goal again is to make this seamless for faculty so that if you wanted to utilize something in your course, you could copy it from this site directly into your own Canvas course site. Really easy, done, ready to go. Um, so as you'll see at the beginning, we have information about how to orient to the project, including information about how the repository works, what the goals of the repository are, things like that. Um, then there's also um, little areas we've set up. These are, again, are kind of temporary for right now, but you'll see that starting to put in some of the resources that members of our team have already developed. So our vision is that our team would develop some of these resources that we've used in our own classes and that we found to be successful. Our next step is going to be recruiting some beta testers from different departments and different courses to try some of these out in their own classes and give us some feedback on how they're working. We want feedback from faculty and from students. So one of the opportunities we have for you is um, potentially starting in the next academic year, depending on how things shake out, you'd like to be one of our beta testers, we are um, looking for folks to volunteer and that is an opportunity that does come with some professional development support for you as well. And that in terms of funds. Uh, so you'll see here in the metacognition series of activities, a couple of contributions from members of our team, a set of uh, pre and post exam reflections that Becca developed. We also have a series of in class activities on scaffolding metacognition that Cheryl developed for her introductory biology course. So I'm just going to show you one quick example and I'll give you an idea of how this works. So as a member of the repository, you would be able to come in here and you'll notice you've got access to the materials. We're trying to provide this in a couple different ways to make it really easy for you. So if this is something you want to copy, just write into your course you can. Or if you'd like to just download the instructions as a Word document so that you can kind of play with that and make it your own, it's available to you in multiple formats as well. Um, so if you, this is quick, something that you, you just, wanted to use in course, oh yes. Can I just interrupt you? Can you just define yeah. learning object? I think that's not a clear. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's I'm doing instructional design talk. So basically, this is any kind of resource you might be able to utilize in your classes. We're really focusing on things like short assignments, like reflective writing, uh, potentially like short quizzes to kind of gauge students understanding and confidence, um, also maybe how they're feeling in terms of um, metacognition and mindfulness. Um, so it's a lot of uh, quizzes uh, that you can pull right into your course, really simple assignments, uh, test questions. So if you want to do an exam wrapper, like a before the test and after test questions to gauge how students feel about their performance, you can bring all those things in. Um, in a learning repository, you'd also have a lot of resources and things like that. We haven't yet decided how those are going to be curated, but you can expect to find some general resources as well. So hopefully that explains it. It's yeah. kind of like all this stuff you can yeah. use in your classes. So thanks, Becca. Yeah. Sometimes I have to. Well, and I think we might need that. to move on to June just because we have about yes. four to five more minutes here for you. Absolutely. Awesome. So one last thing I'll show you is just how easy this should be to use. If you want to put something in your class, um, all you're going to need to do is copy it, navigate to the course that you teach, Mine's down in here somewhere. Hit copy, you tell it where you want it to go in your course, it's gonna be right in there for you to use. So if it's an assignment or a quiz, a video, there's all kinds of stuff in here that you can check out. Um, that'll be available to you really well. To share, it's also really easy. If you have something you wanna share, there's also um, an option here that says send to. 
So if you've got something in your own course and you want to send it to us for consideration for the repository you send to, we haven't decided what email address we're going to use for this yet, but you're going to put in that address. It's going to send it up and we'll be able to review it and put it into the site. So it's going to be really simple, hopefully. Um, I'm going to pop back over to the PowerPoint presentation because I'm going to DJ for June just so we don't have to keep uh, switching back and forth. So I'll hand it over to her. Um, and in a minute, I'm also going to put the link to um, a form where you can volunteer if you'd like to be a beta tester or get involved in other ways in the chat window. Great. Thanks, Joy. So um, as, uh, as Joy mentioned, we really have a strong interest in synergizing pedagogy with empirically backed research and really to support the goal of attending to the cognitive and emotional wellness of our students and as they're connected to some of our roles as instructors. So on the next slide, um, thanks, Joy. Mm -hmm. Um, what we're going to be really thinking about is not only serving as instructors, but really kind of doing this in the context of understanding the great challenges to mental wellnesses that are facing college campuses today. And as many of us are acutely aware of right now, um, this challenge is only amplified during the context of this pandemic and is likely to sustain over the Health challenges facing students today. Um, and again, we're doing some research right now with college students here at CU during the pandemic, hypothesizing that these rates are only going to increase uh, in the coming months. So we know that students are facing severe and costly emotional difficulties that are uh, greater than the general population and have increased over recent years. Um, so one in three students reporting prolonged periods of depression half of students rating their mental health below average or poor, one in seven engaging in abnormally reckless behavior, so this is going beyond normative experimentation that can take place during the college years, and really alarmingly are the high rates of suicide, with up to one in four students reporting um, frequent and distressing suicidal ideation. Um, importantly though, we know that these mental health challenges have cascading impacts. So these go beyond simply students. So we know that the mental health challenges that students face impact their peers. So we can click Joy. Um, they impact our interactions with faculty um, in terms of, you know, grips coming to sort of terms and sort of thinking about how we are going to uh, adapt to the changing landscape of emotion, emotional wellness in students. College counseling centers are having an influx in the severity and number of cases. Um, at the next level, Joy, we're seeing uh, attrition rates decrease. Again, these are only likely to exacerbate in the coming months and years following this acute socio-emotional stressor faced by the pandemic and really ultimately is sort of impeding with the very learning goals we have for students. And so we think it's really important to not just attend to what students are learning and how well they're learning this, but how this is really interfacing with their wellness, um, their sense of sort of metacognition and generally their, their, their well-being. So if we go to the next page, one of our key goals here is not just to sort of think about this in the context um, of, of courses and our roles as instructors, but also to actually get some information and really think about concrete ways we can integrate research with our pedagogical practice. And through our group, what we wanna do is to track changes systematically in student emotional wellness and metacognition. So our goals for um, our courses and partners who wanna join is we have these measures, program in Qualtrics, I have IRB approval, um, and so for uh, courses who want to engage with us, there would be a brief survey that students would complete at the beginning of class where we can get a sense of coming into this class, what are a sense of their metacognition beliefs about their own learnings, similar to some of the measures that Becca showed earlier. Can we get a sense of their emotional health, sense of happiness, sense of wellness, and also kind of index where are they in terms of their anticipated course performance and engagement. But the really critical piece of this is going to look at change over time. So not only does their engagement with the course change change over time, but how does this relate to their emotional health and wellness? We've gained some pilot data over the past year. Um, Amanda knows about this um, as part of my other participation with ASSET uh, faculty fellows. We've looked at do courses on wellness, do courses that teach students about the science of happiness actually impact their well-being and health, um, but we want to expand our repertoire to think more broadly about how are the courses we're teaching for students actually changing 
and impacting their beliefs, their health, and their wellness. And then to look at those in association with how they're doing in the class. I think we might have a lot of folk theories or beliefs about how we think our courses are impacting students, but it's time to kind of gather data and then to use that data to inform the way we're teaching our courses and to really consider students from a more holistic perspective. So our goal is to implement this as widely as possible in the coming year. It is remote based, so this can be done whether your courses are going to be taught in person or whether they're going to be remote. Um, and to know that this is free for you and that we can help manage this and we can help administer it and we've got all the ethics approval. So this isn't an added burden on instructors. Joy, do you want to go next? Actually, you know what, we really have to end or Eric will not get his 10 minutes. So. <laughs> Joy, do you mind just putting the um, link in the chat box? And there was one question that came up during the presentation, which was regarding the learning objects. And just to um, answer that really quickly, we're trying to design learning objects that are not discipline specific. Obviously, whether or not you give exams might make them discipline specific, but we're trying to have a wide range of prompts so that people can use them in different courses. So Eric, are you prepared to share your screen? I'm sorry, we only have about nine minutes. There's sort of a firm stop at 4.30 here. Sure. So um <clears throat> let me and while you're doing that mike's also asking about evaluation of learning objects and i would just say my experience is students will engage with them without any assessment or points attached to them and i don't think you're we're looking necessarily to evaluate them as much as to gather information and encourage students to go through the process of self-assessment but go ahead eric so do you see my first slide Title yes. slide? Yes, we got it. Okay, great. So um, we're the Asset Incubator Inclusive Data Science team. Um, and so there, there are seven of us and three asset facilitators. And so what we're proposing right now is to create a course called Interdisciplinary Data Science for All. Um, and just one slide about the uh, kind of the context is that kind of what we're building towards is to create the big tent for data science at CU. So the big tent does three things. It attracts new people into data science. So this would be you know, maybe data science curious faculty who want to incorporate more data science into their teaching or students who want to learn more data science. Um, if we have a big tent, it'll attract more people into data science. The second thing is that a big tent curates community for data science. You know, both in supporting research and supporting teaching. So of the folks who are doing data science, we have this, this framework of the big tent. Um, we can support researchers to use more data science in their research and support teachers who want to add some data science modules to improve the, the education of their students. A third thing a data science big tent would do would be to promote data science at CU externally. So to external funders, um, to the public at large, they could see, okay, there's this big tent data science, lots of interesting things happening inside that tent. So one of those things that we're trying to propose now for what's to happen inside this uh, big tent is the interdisciplinary data science for all course. So, we're proposing to develop and, te and team teach a course for first year students uh, that really does three things. Um, at first, it serves as an on-ramp into data science for arts and, arts and humanities students um, to learn the technical skills of statistical thinking, computing, and data management. Um, so this would be you know, a course for humanities students, freshmen, to learn some technical skills. Um, but it would also be a course, this part B, is that it would educate students in the humanistic thinking, so humanity modes of inquiry, to be applied to the collection and, and analysis of data um, and doing, doing data science. Um, so that's something that's often missing, is this humanities perspective in the, in the practice of data science, the doing of data science. And so we want to develop a course that incorporates all the humanities modes of inquiry into analyzing data, making arguments with data. And what this course would do would help create the educational foundation for the, uh, for the educational component of this big tent for data science at CU. Um, and, you know, 
one of the one of the cool things that we're envisioning for our course, um, which would start in actually in fall 2021, um, is that this course would satisfy the quantitative reasoning requirement for arts and humanities students, or it would satisfy a humanities requirement for quantitative students from computer science, applied math, um, or some uh, some science discipline. Um, and so, you know, I guess if there's time to get feedback on this idea, um, or I don't know if this is the right the right venue for it. Um, what do you think? I could actually talk about this the image that we have on the right, or we just that's it because that's that's the last slide I have. Definitely take questions. There's a question from Andy, but I think it's going to be good to wait just a minute to um, to use that as a wrap up. But are there any questions about this project or feedback, comments? Do you, so Eric, do you want to describe, take another minute to describe your, uh, your uh, image there? Sure. So the idea um, is that we would have an, an interdisciplinary data science course um, for first year students. And then there would be several connector courses that um, are discipline specific. So, you know, in biology, they have quantitative methods you know, for biology. So it's using, using the skills and tools that the students learn in, their fir in the first course, but applied to biology problems or applied to sociology problems, statistics, English, et cetera. Um, there could be connector courses in all sorts of different fields. There already are connector courses that we could, you know, incorporate, or there could be new new courses developed to, you know, as as students are learning more data science and using that for inquiry into the disciplines. Um, but then the the uh, kind of the the new idea is that we would have an interdisciplinary capstone course. So seniors coming from you know diversity of majors would work together you know, in a capstone course in their final year um, on, you know, a very interesting problem that uses data science and draws from the, the disciplinary strengths of all of the students on the team. And are, so are these courses housed in arts and sciences? Is anyone going to be able to teach them or is it housed in a particular department or school? So the, um, our proposal for the interdisciplinary data science for all course would be that it would be yeah, like a like an arts and science, or maybe a digital humanities listing, um, and that that currently somebody from you know the quantitative sciences and somebody from humanities would be team teaching two people, and that could rotate. Um, but then these connector courses are courses that are often already taught in throughout the college of arts and sciences, um, and then the interdisciplinary capstone course would also be like a a college-wide type of course. Awesome. So I, I think, um, thanks, Eric. Um, I think because we're getting so close to the end here, I just wanted to summarize um, and maybe connect to why we're here. First of all, we all appreciate you all coming and listening to us talk about our projects. We've been um, working on them for about a year now, so it's exciting to have a place to share them. We, um, and I don't know if you really got a feeling for this, but the way that Asset put this out, anybody who applied got to participate. So that's a pretty unusual grant funding type of situation. So we all felt pretty excited that they found a creative way to connect people from all across campus and to allow us all have a voice on our projects, as opposed to sort of picking the best projects and awarding them money. So we're hoping that, um, you know, you're all kind of finding a way to connect with one of these projects. I put the incubator, um, address in the chat window if you want to check it out. And again, we will be looking for faculty participation in a lot of these projects. So um, I know that Andy sort of brought up the issue about structural incentives, and I'm not sure. I know that we've had a lot of conversations about the way this is funded. I think professional development is really the only way that we can um, be supporting people financially. That's probably a question for Blair, but I I think we're sort of at the end of our time here. But I think that's a great idea for, for us to think about ways to maybe support people that are going to have um, a stretch in their department with teaching loads come the fall. So um, please feel free to reach out to us, check in with the website. Um, and uh, now you have a sense of who's on these projects and maybe who you could chat with. 
So any last comments, feel free to go. It's 4.30. If you'd like to stick around um, and chat with us, I can stay around for a few minutes too. Becca, I can hang around for a few minutes as well. Awesome. Thanks. I don't know if Andy's still here. If he had a um, interdisciplinary course. It just seems like there's a lot of synergies with the interdisciplinary report that recently came out on campus that there certainly will be a great place for this. And then synergies with the space miner who, who did something similar. And if you haven't been working with them, I think you should because they've got this space miner mostly for, you know, humanities majors and not aerospace majors, but other majors to learn more about space and, um, and how that um, could impact their, their diverse majors. And it's a very similar program. It sounds like there could be some wonderful synergies uh, with them. Cool, thank you. We'll check it out. I also think that Robin Burke. Sorry. Presentation. I think 